All right, we're going to try this one more time, and we've shut down the program and trying to get it going again. And uh, so hopefully we can get this uh, get this squared away. I like to hope that that folks will come back with us and uh, see if we have uh, have a live a live screen. Um, I'm not seeing anything come up yet on the on the channel. Um, all right, there's Miss Carrie. Just on the home page. If I go to, let's see if I go to renewed covenant. All right, Miss Carrie, are you watching us on the home page or on the renewed covenant? I'm on renewed covenant. All right, so we're we're good to go now. We're yeah, and I'm not on here. It's just weird. It's just kind of weird. So, uh, all right. So we're going to try this thing again. So hopefully, uh, if it freezes up, we, you know, we may just have to have to shut it down and, and go, you know, go one more time. So there I, I am, I have me on. It's kind of weird. So there, there we are. So, uh, okay. All right. We're going to try this thing again. So hopefully. we get out, get off the phone there. All right. Well, hopefully we can get our, get our group back and we can, uh, have good, uh, good Bible study tonight. Uh, let me see if I can get in contact uh, with some uh, uh, some others and um, share this to your page and uh, invite others to come uh, and to be a part of what's going on. And uh, t typical uh, technology, crazy, crazy, crazy. And um, don't know if it's fighting or or if it's just uh, one of those things. I think a lot of times we we blame the devil for things that uh, really he has, he has nothing, nothing to do with. I've often wondered if a lot of times if the things that hinder us in our life are not, not the devil, but it's the, it's the father trying to keep us from going a certain direction or doing a certain thing or continuing a certain path. And so uh, a lot of times people want to blame the devil for things not going right in their life. Maybe the father's making things not go right in our life because he's trying to get us back in line and get us back to where we need to be. Think about how he brought evil upon, upon the children of Israel. There, there's brother Greg. All right. Praise, praise, praise the father for that. Um, he brought evil against Israel because trying to get them back to where they needed to be. And a lot, like I said, a lot of times we blame the devil for things like that. And, uh, and father's the one that uh, is bringing those things upon us in order that we can get back in line. So, um, I have no idea what's going on, but we're back on right now. And so we want to try to keep it going as best as we can. Uh, and we're going to pray. We probably should have prayed before <laughs> maybe when that was, I was trying to, I was, yeah, I was. So, uh, let's pray tonight and ask the father's blessing on our uh, our broadcast again. I give him all praise and glory for healing my chicken and uh, and uh, touching our little animals. And I praise him for his graciousness uh, and his blessings on our life. So let's pray tonight, Father. We do love you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. We do ask you that you'll keep our equipment in good working condition. We pray, Father, that you'd help us, Father, to, to go through this tonight uh, and to teach, Father, that you'd speak through us and use us for your glory and for your honor, that you would help those uh, that are coming into truth and help those young people and those uh, those young believers that are coming into truth to, uh, to grow in accordance to your grace and your mercy. Bless God and direct everyone that will be listening. May you send the Holy Spirit to speak to hearts and do that which needs to be done. And we'll love you and thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. All right. Well, um, as I was saying before, there's a lot of people that's coming into Torah and coming into truth, uh, especially out of Christianity and out of the church, because they're seeing hypocrisy and they're seeing things that are going on within the church that are not right, that don't match with scripture, that don't line up with scripture. You're seeing a lot of false teachers. You're seeing a lot of charlatans. You're seeing a lot of of uh, fly-by-night, uh, uh, we call them snake oil salesmen. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of people are coming out of that because they're seeing the hypocrisy. And uh, so I'm, I wanted to go back 
tonight and sort of touch base on some of those things um, that uh, that we see happening uh, and that people struggle with. They they think they come into Torah and and they've got to start doing everything. They got to start knocking it out, you know. And and if they're not doing that, and if they're not doing everything, and they're not doing everything like some rabbi tells them, or or like some messianic group tells them, or like some assembly tells them, or like you know some Bible student or or some some leader tells them, uh, then they feel like that they're not that they're not. Um, uh, qualified or, or, or they're not adequate enough. And so, so I wanted to sort of deal with this tonight and look at what the scripture says and, and, and what the Bible's telling us and showing us how, how we are to walk in our faith. And we go back to basics and where we're supposed to start with so that we can grow in grace and admonition of, of Yahweh. And uh, so the best place to start would be in Acts chapter number 15, which would be the transition time coming from where it was just Jews uh, and and uh, Jew, uh, those in Judea that were coming to faith. And then, of course, uh, after Acts chapter number 10, uh, Peter and Cornelius, we see the introduction of the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, and then the Gentiles, of course, coming into faith. And then Acts chapter number 15 is a very pivotal chapter because a lot of people within the church, they use Acts chapter number 15 to basically to justify violating Torah and violating uh, the commandments because of certain wording. And so I want to look at that tonight and sort of give you something to think about and something to chew on uh, and something to consider as we uh, go into the scriptures tonight. Uh, and so if you've got your Bibles, let's go right into uh, the uh, the word and we're going to go right back to the basics, getting back to the basics. OK, and so in Acts chapter number 15, if you got your Bible, we're going to be looking at verses one through twenty nine. And then we're going to be looking at some other verses also to sort of lay the foundation, sort of get an idea. And this this may not be all exhaustive. Uh, probably, you know, this is just enough to whet your appetite and cause you to do study uh, and cause you to um, be able to share truth with some of your friends that are coming out of religion and into truth and help them to understand uh, uh, what the scripture is, uh, is uh, showing us uh, uh, here in the book of Acts. And so we begin in Acts chapter number 15 and verses 1 through 29. It says, and certain men which came from Judea, taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation. Hello, brother Paul, glad to have you back. Amen. Uh, when, uh, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. All this was taking place at Antioch. And so you see, if you go back to chapter 14 of Acts, you'll see that, that this is where, uh, where Paul stayed with the, with the people there in Antioch and, and, and uh, dwelt with the disciples there and, and, and uh, uh, a lot of transition time taking place here. Um, in verse number three, and being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria declaring the con the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they re were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that Elohim had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago Elohim made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. This is Peter recanting it or not recanting, but re recalling uh, and recollecting his, uh, his uh, incident there in Acts chapter number 10 uh, with uh, Cornelius. Of course, this is also the same chapter that people want to use to say, that, uh, you know, you can eat anything you want to eat. And of course, you know, uh, misinterpreting Peter's dream uh, of the sheep uh, and the unclean animals. Verse eight, and Elohim, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit 
even as he did unto us and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye Elohim to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the master Yeshua Messiah, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders Elohim had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Now, James, of course, his real name is Jacob. This would be the brother of Yeshua, uh, the half, half brother of Messiah. Um, we see here he is the bishop, if you will, or the uh, overseer of the assembly there at Jerusalem. And, and he's the one that's speaking here, okay? He's, he's, making, he's making a judgment decision. In verse 14, Simeon had declared how Elohim at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name, to take out of the Gentiles a people for his name, okay? And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, after this, I will return and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down and I will build again the ruins thereof. And I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after Yahweh and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith Yahweh, who doeth all these things known unto Elohim are all his works from the beginning of the world. And of course, this is, uh, this is written there uh, uh, in, the, in the scriptures. Uh, they're concerning the, the, in the book of Psalms and in the book of Amos. Uh, 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 James quoting um, from the prophet Amos and also uh, there in the book of Psalms. Verse 19, wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to Elohim, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Notice the key there. Now, a, a lot, lot of people will stop at verse number 20 and then they will not read verse number 21 or verse number 21 get, you know, lays, the, lays the foundation. Verse 20 is the criteria and verse 21 uh, is the answer. And that Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased at the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are, are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, now, I put in brackets there, you must, because that is added by the English translators in our English Bible, depending upon which one you read. Of course, this is coming from the King James. Uh, you must was added by the translators, and you look at the Greek, and it's not there. So it really should read, which went out from us having troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our master, Yeshua Messiah. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, and from which if you keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. And this is a letter that was written to the Gentiles there at Antioch and, and uh, um, let's see, Antioch, Cilicia, uh, and Syria. And this came from James. James made the final decision. He, he was the, the overseer of the assembly. And after the disputation and after the argument and after the fussing and the fighting, uh, they came to a conclusion as to how they should handle this and how it should be should be uh, uh, terminated. And so, also in Acts chapter number twenty, verse number or verse twenty, chapter twenty one, verse twenty five, it's repeated again. Where Paul says, "As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded, 
And here I've bracketed this only because this too was added by the translators, which totally changes the meaning of the sentence. They added that they must observe no such thing save only. I've heard people tell me, well, all I got to do is those four things. Of course, then my answer is, oh, okay, so now, so now stealing's okay because that wasn't one of them things, okay? Uh, 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 blasphemy is okay because that ain't one of them things. Uh, um, uh, be, uh, being disobedient to parents, that, that's okay because that ain't one of them things. Coveting your neighbor's goods and your neighbor's wife, that's okay now because that's not one of them things. And, and because that wording was added, it totally changes the meaning, and that is not in the uh, in the Greek text. I read that from the from the Septuagint. I read that from the Peshitta. It's not in the Greek text. And it says, "As touching the Gentiles, which believe, we have written and concluded that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from strangled, and from fornication." Which is exactly what chapter number fifteen said. Now, when you look at the way that the wording is done within our English language and our English confines, uh, <laughs> uh, Terry says she just read Acts 15 today. So, uh, hey, you know, great minds think alike. Amen. And so, um, you know, there's a reason for everything. And I don't know, I don't profess to know everything, but I know that the Father has a reason for everything. And for everything, there is a time and there is a season, Ecclesiastes 3. And uh, so when you look at this and you look at how the wording is and how this thing is worded, it really causes one to, to, to stop for just a moment and to consider what is being said and what is being discussed here. And so I want to go and I want to break this down a little bit to sort of give you a little bit of insight as to what was taking place with some key words and key phrases that many times are misunderstood and left out. Many people will use these verses of scripture to say, well, we don't have to do the law anymore. We have to keep the law anymore. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and then of course people quote, quote Paul from the book of Galatians and the book of Romans and, you know, and some of his other writings uh, where they assume that Paul says we don't have to keep the law anymore. But then in Acts chapter number 24, I believe it is, uh, in the verse number, uh, let's see if I can pull, let's see if I can pull that up. Chapter 24, verse 14, Paul said, but this, I confess unto thee that after the way, which they call heresy or occult, so worship I the Elohim of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and in the prophets. And so when we look at that in context and we see what Paul writes there, uh, either Paul was a schizophrenic or Paul was a false prophet or Paul was misunderstood. And so I just want to, want to break this down, this whole section and this whole conversation and this whole argument that came up about the Gentiles and how we've misinterpreted and we've overlooked some things that are written right there in, in the scriptures. So we, we, we see the first phrase there in verse number one where it says, certain men from Judea. Chapter 15, verse number one says, says, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Well, first of all, these are not believers. The key is right there in verse number one. Certain men which came down from Judea. These are Jews. These are Jews. <coughs> And these are Jews that are teaching that one must be circumcised in order to be saved. Now, I'm going to go on record to say that I believe circumcision uh, should still be practiced. But circumcision is not a salvation issue. And we're going to look at that and we're going to see that here in just a little bit uh, as to where it all transpired from all the way back in the book of Genesis. In Acts chapter number 10, verse number 45, it's referring to the people of the circumcision says, and they of the circumcision, which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because then on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Who was the circumcision? The circumcision were the Jews. It was the circumcision party. That would be the, that would be the Pharisees and that would be the, 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 the keepers of the law. And, and we're going to get in that in just a minute also. 
in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, Paul uses the phrase again where he says, wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Again, referring to the circumcision party or the Judaizers, okay? We've been called Judaizers. We've been called Judaizers because we believe that all the Bible is still true. We believe that all the scripture is still relevant. We believe that all the commandments, all 613 commandments are still relevant at certain, uh, uh, under certain conditions. <clears throat> and yet we've been called Judaizers, okay? But this is what this is talking about. In verse number one, it's referring to these Jews of the circumcision, okay? Because look at what they said. They said they came down from Judea. This is what a Jew is. Jew, a Jew is one who comes from Judea, okay? Certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, saying, taught the brethren, saying, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So here we see the circumcision party, okay? Now, there's also another phrase there in verse number five of Acts 15 concerning the sect of the Pharisees which believed. These are Pharisees. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee, and, and Nicodemus was a Pharisee. <clears throat> I should have put Paul up there, but I didn't. But Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews and a ruler of the Pharisees. Paul, a high officer within the confines of the Pharisees. And verse number five said, but there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law. There's that phrase needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law. What law are they talking about? Well, of course they're talking about the law of Moses, but they're also talking about the, their oral law and their oral Torah, because remember their law added fences to the Torah. For example, it was um, it was against the law of the Pharisees to spit on the ground on Sabbath. Because if you spat on the ground on Sabbath, your spit could germinate a seed and that seed could grow and then you would be guilty of violating the Torah of, of conducting agriculture on the Sabbath. That's crazy. That's literal craziness, okay? So when they were talking about the law of Moses, they, they apply the law of Moses to include their fences that they've added. Now think about what they do with the little boxes on their heads and the, and the things around their wrists, okay? They, they, they've added those things to, to the Shema out of Deuteronomy chapter number 6. They add things it's called the tradition of the elders. That that's exactly right, Brother Paul. Remember the remember the argument, or not so much the argument, but the the well, I guess it would have been an argument, but the the uh, <clears throat> debate between Yeshua and the Pharisees in Mark chapter number seven says there, um, Mark chapter seven, verse one. I'll just begin reading in verse one. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault because part of their law that they considered the law of Moses was that if you didn't wash your hands before you ate, you were in violation of the Torah. They also believed within certain sects of the Pharisees law and added to the law of Moses that you could contract idolatry by shaking a Gentile's hand. Okay? For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. There's what Brother Paul just mentioned. And when they come from the market, except they wash, the, wash they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brass and vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why walk not thy disciples according 
to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands. Look what Yeshua said. Verse 6, he answered and said unto them, Well has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. As is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And so when you see what's happening here in Judea, they came down from Judea and they were teaching the brethren that in order for them to be saved, they had to be circumcised. And then the Pharisees that were believers came in and said, okay, they got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, okay? Which would include the oral law, which would include their, their, their traditions of the elders, if you will, okay? But what does Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 12 say? Well, says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father was, was pertaining to the flesh had found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before Elohim. Did you think I was froze up again? I was froze up again. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed Elohim, and it was accounted, it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom Elohim imputes righteousness without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom Yahweh will not impute sin. Come at this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. There's that phrase again. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. When did Abraham, when was Abraham's righteousness or his faith accounted to him for righteousness before he was circumcised. He was walking out the commandments of the father and it was his circumcision that came after. And that circumcision was a sign, uh, if you will, a covenant between him and the heavenly father and the creator. And it go, Paul goes on to say, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So Abraham followed the laws, the commandments, the statutes of Yahweh before he was circumcised, but it was, it, it, it was then in his faith it was counted for righteousness before he was ever circumcised. And so here we have the Pharisees and the Judaizers coming in and they're saying that, well, you got to be circumcised or you can't be saved. Well, then Abraham never was saved until he was circumcised, but the scripture doesn't say that. Genesis doesn't say that, and Paul does not write that in Romans chapter 4. Paul writes that, that the circumcision was an outward sign or an outward seal of righteousness, if you will. Okay, And so James or Jacob in his wisdom laid the foundation as to what would be the basics, if you will, when a person came to faith, what would be their basics? See, when we were in the church, and I, I think most everybody that's watching tonight uh, was in the church at one time made a profession of faith and became a believer in Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And through a series of events, they've learned more than what the 
church was teaching them and they've learned that there's been some some misinterpretation of scripture and they've learned that there's been some things uh, that have not been uh, properly taught and there's been some things that have not been properly carried out. And so they chose to go deeper with the father. And so they came into what we know of as Torah. And uh, we all had basics for new believers in the church. Y'all remember that? Remember that, Miss Sharon, having the basics? Have the basics, you know? Well, well, you know, somebody somebody walks the aisle and they make a profession of faith. You know, you take them down to the prayer bench or or the altar, if you will, the you know, the steps there by the front. And or or, or you take them in a back room and you you counsel them uh, concerning salvation, and then they make a profession of faith. And and choose to become believers in Yeshua and 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 Yahweh, uh, Jesus, and uh, so then so then they they say, well, what do I need to do next? All right, when you need to get baptized, you need to get baptized. Baptism is what? What's baptism? It is a seal, an outward seal of right of one's righteousness. It's a testimony of one's faith. It's your first. It's your first testimony of faith. What else I got to do? Well, you need to. You need to start coming to church on Sunday. You need to start coming to church on Sunday. All right. You need to start reading your Bible. Don't start with Ezekiel. <laughs> Read and always start. They always start in the New Testament. You need to read John. And you need to read Romans and you can read a couple of the Psalms. What we need to start telling people to do is you need to start in Genesis and you need to read what thus saith Yahweh from the beginning. But most time churches say we'll start with the gospel of John. Gospel of John is great. It is. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a recap of the beginning, but we need to go back to the beginning. And so you got those basics. Well, what else do I need to do? Okay, you need to quit drinking. You need to quit smoking. You need to quit adultering. You need to quit carousing. You need to you need to 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 straighten up and fly right. The basics. That's exactly the way we did it in in the church. But it's amazing that when you start telling people and teaching people about keeping the commandments. And keeping the commands of Yahweh, oh, we don't have to do that. All we got to do is these four things. We just got to do these four things right, right here. Okay, well, let's do these four things, okay? So let's look and see what these four things are. First one, Acts 15, verse number 20. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication and from things strangled and from blood, for Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. I forgot to put one on. I'll, I'll add that later on in my, in my PowerPoint. So first of all, we need to abstain from idolatry. That would be sacrificing to idols, eating foods offered to idols, worship of idols, reverence of idols, or false deities. Now, I'm going to stop right there, and I'm going to park it here just for a minute. We're going to talk about what we do within the confines of religion that is idolatry, okay? Do what? And we don't even know it. That's exactly right. Let's start. Let's start at the beginning. We'll start in January. New Year's, New Year's, idolatry, worship and reverence of the of the false deity Janus, two headed, two headed Roman deity. Looking back and looking forward, that's that's what New Year's celebration is based on. We had no no idea, and we're having New Year celebration. We're banging pots and pans together, shooting off fireworks. Blah! And that's not even the new year. The new year's coming up next week. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Oh, we love our we we, we love our sweetheart, and we're gonna go get a little 
heart filled with candy and we're going to get them a get them a little gift and hey that that that's a false deity that's worship of a false deity that's what it is cupid and you know all those kind of cute little things false deities okay easter coming up coming up for the church easter easter represents ishtar or Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, the founder of Babel and Babylon. Easter represents Ishtar and the, the worship of bunnies and things like that and, and goes back to Tammuz and the women weeping for Tammuz there. I believe it's in the book of Jeremiah. Idolatry, Ishtar, Easter, nothing about that in Scripture. Um, Christmas. Oh, well, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus. No, you're not. You're celebrating Saturnalia and the worship of the sun god. Idolatry. Sacrificing to idols would be would be uh, uh, worshiping. You might not be sacrificing animals, but you're you're giving of gifts and you're buying things in order that you may celebrate your pagan holidays and your pagan celebrations. That's idolatry, because because we should have no mighty ones before Elohim, no mighty ones. There is no other. Mighty one. There is no other almighty than Yahweh. So, so the church, we as, oh, oh, oh let, let's talk about that cross on the wall. Cross on the wall, that's the Tammuz cross. Doesn't represent Messiah. Doesn't represent Yahweh. The cross never represented Yahweh. The menorah represented Yahweh. The Torah represented Yahweh, but not the cross. The cross or the stake was a torture stake. It was a death. It was a death item, not to be glorified. But how many songs do we sing? Oh, I'll cherish the old rugged cross where my trophies at last I lay down. We're going to lay our trophies down at the cross. I will cling to the old rugged cross. That's that's worship. That's idolatry. Or what about this one? Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. Kneeling at a cross. That's idolatry. You kneel down. We 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 watched a film the other night, and and they were singing they were singing Christmas carols, and they were in a circle around a Christmas tree. And they were singing Christmas carols, looking at the Christmas tree. What about the song? Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, how lovely are your branches. That's idolatry. That's the same thing these Gentiles were doing that were coming out of Gentile religion and coming into Torah. But now we who have come in the Torah are the ones who are being accused of being a Judaizer because we want to put away those things of idolatry. But yet the church says, oh, you, you are a Judaizer. But right out of the Gospels or right out of the book of Acts, it says the first thing you're supposed to do is abstain from idolatry. We've, we've lifted up man-made idols. We've lifted up false deities. We've lifted up the reverence of, of pagan celebrations and pagan hol holidays while rejecting the feasts and festivals and holy days of our almighty sovereign. We're supposed to be celebrating Passover and unleavened bread coming up, not Easter. Lent. Lent is a is a... Uh, an idolatrous uh, celebration dealing with Tammuz, who was the son of Nimrod and Semiramis, who was killed by a wild boar when he was 40 years old. And so in order to honor Tammuz, right before the spring equinox, there's 40 days of fasting and 40 days of abstinence 
in honor of Tammuz. That's where that verse scripture refers to. Uh, they were weeping for Tammuz. Yes, Brother Paul, we are Bibleizers. I like that. Bibleizers. We, 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 didn't even got, we didn't even got past the first one yet, and we, we're seeing major problems with the church's argument about these four. All I got to do is these four things. All right, let's get busy with number one. I'm trying to help you tonight to understand there's some things that we're to put away when we come into faith, even in the church, we're to put away. But what the church has done, the church has magnified idolatry. The church has magnified idolatry and turned it into, uh, into a corporate, a corporate entity. Idolatry for hire and idolatry for gain. Go into a Catholic church, go into a Greek Orthodox, go into some of these others that have all these statues. They're not statues of Mary and Jesus and, and, and the apostles. They're statues of pagan, pagan deities that they've changed the names on. Abstain from idolatry. Worshiping the Father, attributing worship to the, the Creator and the Heavenly Father and the Messiah based upon the way the pagans do their worship. And Yahweh says, I don't want you to worship me like that. He said, I don't even want you to mention their names. That's why I don't use the word God to refer to our Creator. I used to until I learned that the word God comes from the Old English and Norse language that means good or gudan that derived from Wodan, the Norse deity, the Norse God. And so when we refer to Elohim as God, we're calling out, calling on a pagan deity. We're calling on a pagan deity. Calling our Elohim and our creator a pagan deity. Abstain from idolatry. All right, let's go to number two. Abstain from fornication. Yeah, I know, Miss Carrie, it is hard to get used to. But this is something that we really need to need to begin to change. What once we know the truth, we're responsible for how we carry out that truth. We cannot continue on and acting like we're we're ignorant of the fact. We've got to make the hard choices. It's kind of like what I put on Facebook the other day. Choose the hard right instead of the easy wrong. Abstain from fornication. Now, the word fornication in the Greek comes from the Greek word porneo, where we get our word pornography. Do you know, and, and, I, and I don't know if it's changed any, uh, me and a, a, a preacher friend had a ministry years ago uh, uh, called Impurity, and what we did is we ministered to preachers that had sex addictions and addictions to pornography. We It, it was estimated that 75 percent of active clergy in America was addicted to internet pornography. 75 percent. We, we can look through the, the internet pages. We can look through the, the online records and we can find countless numbers of men, church leaders, pastors, youth pastors, song leaders that are in prison right now because of child pornography, because of, of, of uh, uh, indecent liberties and sexual relations with underage uh, uh, minors, uh, pastors who have uh, been involved in adultery, fornication, sexual relations outside the bonds of marriage, even homosexuality and, and the like. 
And all of these things fall into the category of fornication. Having, having sexual relations on the internet by yourself is fornication. Sodomy, bestiality. These are all the things that our society has glorified. Even within the confines of Christianity today, we have people like leaders like T.D. Jakes who stands in front of multitudes and teaches people that he's had a change of heart and a change of mind concerning homosexuals in the church and in the pul pulpits. Let me tell you something. The assembly of Yahweh, this, uh, the, the people of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, it's an exclusive organization. It's not open to the public, okay? It's exclusive for only those who have faith and come by the way of faith and obedience. Yet the second thing that James said that these Gentiles need to do was to get away from what they were doing. The temple of Diana mentioned uh, in the book of Acts by Luke in his writings when Paul and I was either Paul and Barnabas or Paul and Silas, I can't remember, where, where they came across the, the, the people there in, the, in Ephesus that were making the little statues for the Temple of Diana. Well, the Temple of Diana, which is also Ishtar, which is also the Roman Catholic Mary, if you didn't know that, um, which, is also the, uh, which is also the Statue of Liberty in, in New York Harbor, which is also the symbol of the Columbia Pictures Lady. Uh, in the movies, okay? Uh, Diana, multi-breasted fertility goddess, goddess of sex and fornication. There were temple priestesses and temple prostitutes and temple homosexuals and sodomites that in order to worship Diana, they would come and then they would have sex, sexual relations with sodomites and with prostitutes. Paul talks about that uh, when he talks about uh, in the passage of scripture where he's talking about women, women and their hair, and that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Okay. Uh, he goes into a little bit. I mean, he, you got to really read between the lines to understand what, what was going on and go back in history and understand that the temple priestesses and the temple prostitutes would shave their head bald. And so they were coming to faith. They were coming into faith, and Paul was, you know, Paul was instructing them to keep their head covered. That's why they'd put the shawl over their head till their hair grew back out, because their hair was a natural covering. But they had shaved their head, the shaved their hair off. And the men were wearing wigs to make themselves look like women, cross-dressing. And so a lot of what was going on today, look at the Biden administration, and you'll see it going on in our even in our government. Yet they were coming to faith and they were coming to trust in Yeshua and, and they were to abstain from that fornication and come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. But look at the church today. Look at the church. Look at religion today. Look at the ungodliness and the wickedness that's taking place within the confines of, of religion that is full of pornography and adultery and sexual relations outside the marriage and homosexuality and lesbianism, sodomy and bestiality, all under the guise of religion. But now, remember, all, all I got to do is these four things. I don't got to do anything else. So far, we're not doing very well. Abstain from idolatry. Are you guys still with me? I see there's four. There may be more, but all I can see is there's four with us. Abstain from idolatry. Abstain from fornication. <clears throat> Number three, abstain from eating strangled. Now, this is dealing with, with the food and the, and the dietary. Okay? That which was strangled was an animal that was deprived of life without shedding of blood, choking, or suffocating. Proper diet and proper food preparation. Well, where do we find that at? Oh, we find that back in Leviticus chapter 11, where Yahweh gave instruction on the diet and the 
proper foods to eat. See, just five chapters back was Peter's vision of the sheep concerning the Gentiles coming into faith. And people took that vision to say, oh, well, we can eat anything we want to eat now. But to abstain from things strangled because part of the pagan rituals and part of the pagan religions was to eat that which was not clean and to eat that which was not, I don't like to use the word kosher, but you know what I mean, not biblically prepared. And so when you, thank you, Brother Greg. Thank you, Brother Paul. Appreciate you guys still still being, being, being with us. When we consider this and we consider the diet that takes place within the confines of the church, people coming out, people coming into faith and they're coming into Torah. And it's really, it's really interesting. And I, I try not to laugh, but I do get tickled because I remember when we did the same thing. And Brother Paul, you might remember this. You know, you come in and you come into an assembly, you come into a group of, and you have no idea what to bring. You have no idea. What am I supposed to eat? You know, what am I supposed to bring? I don't know. And I, I remember my wife's uncle, she, he came into Torah and, and he, he called us at a Thanksgiving dinner and a family Thanksgiving dinner. And he come up beside him and he said, um, what do you guys eat for breakfast? Of course, he's probably going to see this because he watches our stuff on, on YouTube. He said, what do you guys eat for breakfast? I said, eggs and and you know grits or rice or whatever what about meat i said well turkey sausage or you know chicken or whatever you know we're used to eating bacon and sausage i mean that's just you know part of our diet well that was part of the pagan and the 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 gentiles normal diet was eating things that were unclean go go back go back to to um i believe it's mark chapter five I believe it's Mark chapter five. <clears throat> Where he goes to the demoniac of Gadara. So Gadara, yeah, bro, had to be a quick study because you want to show up with something because you show up with something that would be considered unclean and nobody would touch it. You know? <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. We had to learn, learn quick. And you know, people coming in that, you know, they're like, oh, okay. So what do I need to fix? Uh, you know, people thinking that, you know, uh, we can't eat any, any leaven at all. You know, they're thinking three months ago. So I need to bring something without leaven. Oh no, no, no. We got some time on that one. Uh, and I get tickled, but I, but I forget that, you know, that we were in the same boat, uh, years back. But in Mark chapter number five, the demon act of Gadara, Yeshua goes over to the land of the Gadarenes. Anybody know who the Gadarenes were? They were the tribe of Gad that stayed on the other side of the, of the Jordan. Remember, that it, it, it was Gad and Reuben and half tribe of Manasseh that stayed on the other side of Jordan because the, the fields were good for raising cattle. Well, what are the Gadarenes raising when Yeshua goes over there to heal the demon act? Yeah, they were raising pigs. They were raising pigs. Remember, remember when he cast them demons, the 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 legion into the into the pigs. The Bible says that they ran down the hill violently and drowned themselves in the river. First, first biblical reference to suicide. <laughs> my wife tells me that my jokes are old, but. Hey, you know, when you're getting old, that's all you have is old, old jokes. They're raising pigs. Here they are, Israelites. Israelites, very much considered Gentiles, but Israelites that are that are raising things that are are not supposed to be raised for, for human consumption. Because what that did is when Yeshua put them put that, put that legion into them pigs and them pigs ran, uh, ran down the mountain and, and uh, drowned themselves. They, it cut into their finances. It cut into their, their pocket. And they, they wanted to leave their coast, leave their country because he had affected their commerce. 
We're to abstain from eating strangled. And like I said, you could take it further and you could go back to Leviticus 11 and understand what the biblical recommendations and the biblical requirements were. But then also the fourth one was abstain from eating blood. Now I know there's a lot of things going on about this adrenochrome, you know, uh, um, and I, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. If you want to learn more about that, you can research that out. But there's been groups of people for, for centuries and centuries and centuries that drink and eat blood uh, as a part of their diet. And um, it's, it's disgusting. And it's part of the pagan and, and demonic rituals also. In the Genesis chapter number four, uh, nine in verse number four. Let me let me read these verses of scripture for you. Genesis chapter number nine and verse number four. Genesis chapter number nine and verse number four. I appreciate all of you staying with me. Uh, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Leviticus chapter three and verse number seventeen. Leviticus 3 and verse number 17, the Bible says, It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. And then in chapter 7 and verse number 26, chapter 7, verse number 26, Moreover, you shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be a fowl or, or a beast in any of your dwellings. Whosoever eat, Whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. Yeah, Leviticus 7, uh, 17, 14, for it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, you shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. That's exactly right. And so these are the four things, okay? These are the four things. But but what was next? Just those four things? Where are they going to learn the rest? Verse 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every, every Sunday, right? Uh-uh. Every Sabbath day. Okay? Every Sabbath day. Think about this. Where were they going to learn more of the Torah? See, we have this idea within the church confines that that it, it's it's twisted we twisted the word uh, of the scriptures and we we come to faith in messiah we believe yahweh and we begin to walk out his instructions that's what the word torah means instructions the word law was a not a good word and when the pharisees used the word law they're adding the pharisaical laws to the faith in order to place a yoke of burden on the people. Laws included their laws and how they interpreted the laws of Moses. Okay, Remember, Moses' law was not Moses' law. It was Yahweh's law that Moses had written down in the Torah. And you got to remember what some of those laws applied to and some of them didn't apply to. But he says there that that after that verse of scripture uh, where they're going to abstain from all those things, then they're going to learn more every day or every Sabbath day by reading in the synagogues and teaching and preaching of Moses. Well, isn't that what we said grow, uh, coming up in the church? You're going to learn more about Jesus when you come to church on Sunday. You come to church on Sunday, come to Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and you're going to learn more about Jesus. You're going to learn more about the Father, and you're going to learn more, and, and, and that's exactly what James said. You're going to abstain from these four things. You're going to get started. These are your basics, and every Sabbath day, you're going to learn more about the feast, and you're going to learn more about the Sabbath, and you're going to learn more about the dietary instructions. And you're going to learn more about loving your neighbor as yourself. And you're going to learn more about the Father and learn more about our Creator. And you're going to learn more about the calendar and learn more about cosmology. And you're going to learn more about the Savior and more about the Messiah every Sabbath day. 
See, it was the Jews and Pharisees that added all this other stuff, like we saw in verse 1 and verse number 5. Acts chapter number 15, verses 10 and 28. Verse 10 says, Now therefore, why tempt you Elohim? I didn't get that changed. Why tempt you Elohim to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Verse 28, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. What yoke was he talking? What yoke was uh, Peter talking about there? What yoke? What yoke that they were not able to bear? The yoke of the Pharisaical law. The yoke of the law. Not the Torah. The yoke of the, of the law. Well, what did Yeshua say? Matthew 11, verse 29 and 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The burden and the yoke of the Torah is much lighter than the burden and the yoke of the Jews and Pharisees. And that's what the discussion is about. We're looking at this from a Greek mindset, and we've got to put away the Greek mindset, and we've got to look at it from a Hebrew mindset and from a, from a Jewish mindset and how the Jews and Pharisees thought and how they conducted themselves and the way that Yeshua sparred with them on a daily basis. Peter said, Peter said back there, said, said, now therefore, why tempt ye Elohim to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers, who was our fathers, the ones before them, our fathers, nor we were able to bear. You know why? Because you can't keep the law. You can't keep it. You can't keep it. There's, it's, it's, yeah. Remember what Paul said? Uh, in, uh, uh, in in one of his letters, if you fail in one point of the law, you failed in all. So no matter how good you did, but you know what? It's easy to keep the Torah. I think it's easy to keep the Torah. Everything's laid out. It's, I mean, it's all laid out. It's I mean, it's laid out. It tells me what I can eat and what I shouldn't eat. It tells me what days to practice my faith. It tells me what day to 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 rest and to worship. It tells me what days are the holy days that Yahweh wants to meet with his people. It tells me how to love my neighbor and it tells me how to conduct myself with other people. It tells me what Yahweh likes and what Yahweh dislikes. It's, I mean, it really is. It's not hard. It's not hard. But everybody thinks, oh, well, keeping law is hard. You can't do it. No. No, keeping the church law is hard. Keeping the Jews' law is hard. Keeping the Pharisees' law is hard. Even Peter said, why are you tempting Elohim to put a yoke on our neck that even our fathers were not able to, to, to bear it? And that's why Yeshua said what he said. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Who was he talking to? He was talking to the Jewish people there. He was talking to the Jewish people that were burdened under the yoke of the Pharisees' rule. You know, if you go back in history and see where the Pharisees came from, the Pharisees came about after the rule of Antiochus Epiphanes and the, the, the takeover of the Maccabees about 165 B.C., roughly. And it was from there that the sect of the Pharisees came up and the priesthood was taken away and taken to a minimal, and the high priest position was turned into a to a paid position. And you know who could pay the most money to get the the high priest position? Caiaphas was not a, a legitimate high priest. Annas was not a legitimate high priest. And everybody went to the rabbis and the Pharisees for their religious instruction. When before that, it was to be the Levite. And the and the priest. Yeah, Yeshua said there in Matthew 23, 15, Woe and you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold a child of hell. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And the church is doing the same thing because they're taking people out of the world and they're leaving them in the world and trying to put a cloak of religion on them 
and make them feel like they're they're going to heaven when they die and they're living like hell. They're living like the devil and they're breaking the law. They're lawless. Yeshua said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Galatians 5.1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Messiah hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See, everybody thinks Galatians is about Judaizers. It's about being in bondage again. He's talking about the law of the Pharisees. He's not talking about the law or the instructions of Yahweh. Yeshua said that his yoke was easy. You know, I've, I've, I've done a little study on ranching and farming and, and how they train oxen in a yoke. They take an old ox and they put him with a young ox and they yoke them up together. You know, and the young ox is all over the place and the old ox, he's just, you know, doing his thing because he knows what to do. Why they do that? So that they can teach the young ox how he's supposed to conduct himself. And when we yoke ourselves up to Yeshua and he and we walk out the Torah as he has shown us how to do that, it's a whole lot easier than trying to follow the Pharisees' rules and the Jews' rules and the church's rules and Rome's rules and these rules and that rules and just yoke up to Yeshua. Walk alongside him. Learn of him. So I said, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for, for your souls. That's right. You yoke up to Messiah, at least you know that's the right rules, the right way to go. That's the end of my slideshow. <laughs> so what is it that we're that we're considering here? We're considering what the Bible says. The Bible's Jacob, James, and the disciples there at Jerusalem made the final decision. These four things, because you're going to learn the rest of it as you go. You're going to learn the rest of it as you go. And you're going to pick up something new every Sabbath day. And you're going to learn something new. And your walk of faith is going to start to take shape. We don't bring a newborn baby into the world and stick a T-bone steak in front of them and tell them to eat. No, we got to bring them on with milk. That verse scripture, Paul says, I've fed you with milk and not with meat because you were not able to bear it. I believe that's 1 Corinthians. I would venture to say that the vast majority of professing Christians are still drinking on the milk bottles of the word. They can't handle strong meat because they have no, no teeth. They've never grown or matured. All they have is maybe salvation and belief in, in Messiah, Yeshua, or Jesus. And that's all they have because they're not following and they're not learning and they're not being and doing as the father has instructed them to do. It's important for us to understand that the, 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 the laws, the instructions of Yahweh for, for our benefit and for us to grow thereby. Uh, yes, brother Paul, we want to walk in, in the father's ways his instructions as Messiah walked to grow from milk to meat and to be able to disciple others in the kingdom of Elohim. That's exactly right. We are required to be fruitful and multiply. But the problem is most believers don't know how to multiply because they themselves are not grown into a full fruit bearing tree to where they can bring forth fruit. They're still a twig or maybe they're even dead, never even never even grew or amounted to anything. If, if you're just coming into truth and coming into Torah, don't beat yourself up because you don't know everything. Trust me, none of us know everything, okay? And don't, don't be so hard on yourself because you might not get it the first time or the second time or the third time. And it may take you a while to remember when Passover is and to remember when Sukkot or Feast of Tabernacles is, and to remember what, what we can eat and what, we, what we're not supposed to eat. It may take you a while to get used to looking at the, at the labels at the grocery store 
at the ingredients. It may take you a while to get used to that. But don't stop. Keep moving forward. Keep getting to an assembly where they're going to teach you the truth. Get into assembly on the Sabbath day. You say, well, I go to church on Sunday. Okay, fine. Get into a Sabbath fellowship. If there's not a fellowship there, then start practicing Sabbath there at, at your home. Get in an online fellowship. Begin to learn. Begin to grow. Pretty soon, Yahweh will pull you out of that church and put you where you need to be. The important part is, is that we grow in him and that we focus on him and that we are walking in him on a daily basis. That's why it's important to get back to basics. Back to the basics. Abstain from idolatry. Abstain from fornication. Abstain from eating strangled. Abstain from eating blood. Because everyone will learn the Torah on every Sabbath day as you grow in him. Amen? Well, my prayer for you is that you will come to know Yeshua Messiah as your Savior, and you'll believe on Him. Believe in the Father, believe in Yahweh, trust in Him, and He will bring it to pass. Well, thank you for sticking with us. Our broadcast board got off on a rocky rocky start. It took four times to get the get the feed to work. I thank all of you for, for uh, joining. Uh, share this to your page. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, pray with us, if you will. We are praying about maybe uh, getting off of Facebook and going strictly to YouTube Live. We've been doing this broadcast now for uh, about five years. Um, four years here in North Carolina and a year prior. So yeah, right about five years that we've been doing the broadcast um, in one way, shape, or form on Friday nights. And um, just praying for Father's wisdom and, and his... Uh, leadership and guidance job is getting is staying very busy and i don't like being pushed for time and and being covered up all week and it just makes it very difficult so i'm just praying for some clear direction and uh, pray for us and we'll pray for you and i i know father will will lead us in the right direction and we just need to have faith to walk in that direction May you all have a blessed Sabbath day. If you're not in a fellowship, we encourage you, if you're in the Salisbury, North Carolina area, to come and fellowship with us here at Renewed Covenant Fellowship. We'll be meeting at 2 o'clock. Of course, we do follow the Zadok calendar, and so the equinox is tomorrow. Tomorrow is the first day of spring, and so the beginning of the biblical new year begins on Wednesday. And if you want to learn more about the Zadok calendar, you can get in contact with us, and we can help you. Brother Paul is really good about that. Brother Paul, Miss Tina, they can help you also to understand how the priests and how David, King David, and the Zadok priests and the uh, how they followed the truth and uh, followed the true calendar. So pray for us. We'll pray for you. And then also, again, be in, be in Sabbath tomorrow. But take, take your place with your assembly. Get you some rest and be there for him. May Yahweh richly bless you is our prayer. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Shalom.